Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. We're going through the book of Jeremiah slowly but surely. We come today to Jeremiah chapter 46, beginning in verse number 1. This is our fifth series going through the whole Bible verse by verse. The New Testament is done. This series, along with the previous four, are all at the Bible, versebyverse.com, archived for you to go there, choose, click, and listen. Any part of the Bible, any series, any book, any chapter, any section, just choose, click, listen, bring your Bible, a hunger for God's Word, and you're all set. Again, that is at the Bible, versebyverse.com. Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Jeremiah 46. The word of the Lord, which came to Jeremiah the prophet against the nations, against the Gentiles, all the nations except Israel in this particular prophecy. The first one we're going to look at is the prophecy against Egypt. God switches gears here. He had been talking to his people, the Israelites, for a long time. He's been telling them to repent for decades or else. They did not, so they have been punished. Now God speaks to the foreign nations because you know why? Whether they recognize him or not, he's still their God, and he is still their Lord. That's just the way it is. You can recognize God as your God if you want to. If you don't want to, it doesn't matter. He's still your God. He's still your judge. So let's see what he has to say against Egypt first. Against Egypt, against the army of Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, who was by the river Euphrates and Charmachis, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, smote in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. Well, this is a real flashback to many years prior to the destruction of Israel. And this message here was from God, again, to the nation Israel. And he continues in verse 3, Order the buckler and the shield and draw near to battle. In other words, God says, Egypt, get your equipment. Get ready for war. Four, harness the horses and get up. Ye horsemen, stand forth with your helmets, polish the spears, put on the coats of mail. In other words, God says, Egypt, prepare yourself to fight. Verse 5, why have I seen them dismayed and turned away back? And their mighty ones are beaten down and are fled apace and look not back for fear was round about, saith the Lord. God says that the mighty Egyptian army, why are they running away? Like a bunch of scared rabbits, which they were doing at that time. Verse 6. Let not the swift flee away, nor the mighty man escape. They shall stumble and fall towards the north by the river Euphrates. In other words, God says, some of you Egyptian soldiers can run fast. It's not going to be fast enough. God says, some of you are tough, but you're not going to be tough enough. You're going to be defeated no matter how smart, no matter how tough, no matter what you have going for you, you're going to lose. And that's because God was against them. Seven, who is this? that cometh up like a flood, whose waters are moved like the rivers. God says that there is a mighty army that is rising like a flood. But who in the world is it? 
Verse 8, <coughs> Egypt riseth up like a flood, and his waters are moved like the rivers, and he saith, I will go up, I will cover the earth, I will destroy the city and the inhabitants of it. The Egyptian army was seen boasting by God, <clears throat> and they said they're going to wipe everybody out. And that contradicted the word of God, of course. <clears throat> Verse 9. Come up, ye horses, and rage, ye chariots, and like the mighty, let the mighty men come forth, cush and put, that handle the shield and the ludum, that handle and bend the bow. For this is the day of the Lord, God of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge himself on his adversaries. And the sword shall devour, and it shall be filled to the full, and made drunk with their blood. For the Lord God of hosts hath a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. Go up into Gilgal, and take balm, O virgin daughter of Egypt. In vain shalt thou use many medicines, for thou shalt not be cured. The nations have heard of thy shame, and thy cry hath filled the land. For the mighty man hath stumbled against the mighty, and they are fallen both together. In other words, God says, Egypt, you can strengthen yourself the best that you possibly can, but it's not going to do you any good because I'm against you because of your sinful ways. And really, that's the only thing that matters. Whether God is for you or whether he's against you, it doesn't matter what you have going for you. It doesn't matter how much money you have in a bank. It doesn't matter how much education you have. It doesn't matter how many friends you have. If God is against you because you haven't repented and received Christ, you got nothing going for you, nothing that will really help. Yeah, I mean, take care of your relationship with God. Put that first. Get right with him through Christ. And then start thinking about the other things. 13, the word that the Lord spoke to Jeremiah the prophet, how Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, should come and smite the land of Egypt. So this attack on Egypt actually occurred in 568 B.C., 14. Declare ye in Egypt, and publish in Migdal, and publish in in Memphis, and in Taphanes, say, Stand fast and prepare, for the sword shall devour round about thee. In other words, God says, Get ready, because war is coming. 15. Why are they valiant men swept away? Thy valiant men swept away. Why are thy valiant men swept away? They stood not. Because the Lord did not did drive them. So the only thing that matters, as I mentioned, is whether God is on your side or not. And that is clear here because God says that he's going to scare their mighty soldiers off. God says he's, he's going to put panic in their hearts. And this is one thing that you see God doing occasionally in his holy word, meaning that he manipulates the minds of people and he manipulates their emotions so that they do his bidding, even though they don't want to do his bidding. But God is in control of people's minds. When you pray to God and you, and you ask him to change somebody's mind about this or that, you're, you're talking to somebody who has done it and can continue to do it if he chooses to. Now, he'll never violate a person's free will, whether they want to be right with him or not, but there are, there are other things that he can manipulate about what they think to your benefit, to the benefit of Christ. 17. They did cry here, they did cry there. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, is but a noise. He hath passed the time appointed. People are going to say that Pharaoh, king of Egypt, thought that he was big, but that 
was in the past. The king of Egypt is going to be mocked, and they're going to say all that he is is a big talker. And that will happen. After his embarrassing defeat, God will see to it. You know, the Bible says, the person who exalts themselves shall be humbled by God. And that's exactly what he's talking about. Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Boy, he did it with the Pharaoh in Moses' day. And he's going to do it again. He just keeps doing it because people don't change, it seems like. Well, when people don't change. It doesn't matter what their names are. 18, as I live, saith the king, whose name is the Lord of hosts, surely like Tabor among the mountains and like Carmel by the sea, so shall he come. God says, as sure as I am God, trouble is coming your way, Egypt. 19, O thou daughter dwelling in Egypt, furnish thyself to go into captivity, for Memphis shall be waste and desolate without an inhabitant. In other words, God says, pack your suitcases, Egypt, because you're going to be beaten, and then you're going to go into exile. 20, Egypt is like a very fair heifer, but destruction cometh. It cometh out of the north. God says, you look good now, Egypt, but when judgment hits, you're going to look bad. 21, also her hired men are in the midst of her like fatted bullocks, for they also are turned back and are fled away together. They did not stand because the day of their calamity was come upon them and the time of their judgment. It was all over because it was time for judgment to happen. And God is the one who decides when that time will come. And when he decides, that's it. It's etched in eternal stone. Some people think that God is only in control of the Israelites or maybe only in control of Christians today. And in the Old Testament, only, only in control of the nation Israel because they were his children, his people. But that's not true. Because as I alluded to earlier, he's the Lord of everyone. God says that the soldiers that Egypt hired, the mercenaries that he hired to protect them, will run off when it gets rough. You know, it was God's will for America to be founded back in the early days, 1776 and so forth. That's why even though Great Britain was the world superpower, and even though they hired Haitian mercenaries, Providence saw that they lost. Well, we can debate whether we like it or not, but that's the way it was, because that's the way God wanted it to be, and against all odds, the colonies won. Verse 22, the voice of it <clears throat> shall go like a serpent, for they shall march with an army and come against her with axes like hewers of wood. They shall cut down her forest, saith the Lord, though it cannot be searched because they are more than the grasshoppers and are innumerable. The daughter of Egypt shall be confounded, she shall be delivered into the hand of the people of the north, and that refers to Babylon. God says the enemy is going to cut down Egypt like a lumberjack, like a bunch of lumberjacks cut down trees in a forest. <clears throat> Egypt will be as vulnerable as a tree before a lumberjack with a chainsaw. 25. The Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saith, Behold, I will punish the multitude of no. And Pharaoh and Egypt with their gods and their kings, even Pharaoh and all those who trust in him. And I will deliver them into the hand of those who seek their lives. 
and into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of the of his servants, and afterwards it shall be inhabited as in the days of old, saith the Lord. Egypt was defeated, but as God said, they will come back, and they did. Within 40 years, they were back, but they were taught a hard lesson because of their arrogance and their sinfulness. And, of course, because of their idolatry. 27. But fear not, O my servant Jacob, and be not dismayed, O Israel. For behold, I will save thee from afar off, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return and be in rest and at ease and none shall make him afraid. Fear thou not, O Jacob, my servant, saith the Lord, for I am with thee, for I will make a full end of all nations to which I have driven thee, but I will not make a full end to thee. I will not make a full entity, but correct thee in measure. Yet I will not leave thee wholly unpunished. So God showed restraint toward his people, and that's because of the promises that he made to their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So now, once again, God talks to Israel. And he says he will preserve a remnant of his people. Even though most of them are going to be destroyed because of their sin. God always has a remnant in the earth. You know that? No matter how bad things get. He always has a remnant on this planet somewhere. And it is a remnant. A very small minority who serve him. Remember, it got down to eight people in Noah's day. There was only eight people. You talk about a remnant. How about Sodom and Gomorrah? You had Lot out of the whole population. So, you say you feel alone serving the Lord? Well, join the club. It's the way it's always been. It's the way it always will be. You got to decide. You either want Jesus and salvation through him and you want to avoid hell or you want to be popular. You want to be a part of the crowd. You got to make that choice. Too many Christians whine. And and I've said it before. I don't mind a woman whining, (laughs) okay? A Christian woman who feels bad because they're more emotional as a rule. But it's just something about a Christian male who whines about not being liked or popular. Just, But, you know, that's what you get for listening to the Christian psychologists now for the last several decades talk about developing the feminine side of your masculinity as a Christian. You've arrived, many of you. We'll stop right there. Long chapter, a little longer message, but we had to complete it today. So, You can study again God's Word with me anytime that you want to at the Scripture Verse by Verse website found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Go there, choose, click, listen from four complete series going through the whole Bible, verse by verse, going on five. Now, if you'd like to be a part of Scripture Verse by Verse, you know I never water down the Word. I never have. If you want to be a part of this ministry that is faithful to Jesus and faithful to his word, then pray for me in God's word. That helps tremendously. And when you take a break from studying with me at the thebibleversebyverse.com, go to the front page, click the donate button, prayerfully give as the Lord may lead, because that also makes you a big part of this ministry. Thank you. Until next time, so long.